Um, here we go. So today we're going to talk about um, our uh, new latest feature of Globus, the Globus subscription management tool. So I hope we've got lots of our Arnet subscribers on. Um, if you're not a subscriber, um, this may be um, kind of out of your purvey. If not, um, although, you, you know, you can kind of see how you can interact with subscriptions here. So uh, it may be, uh, may be important to you as well. So we did have a blog post that, that we put out earlier. and We put out a couple of different, um, different uh, uh, publications and whatnot uh, advertising our global subscription management. And um, so there it is. If you're interested, certainly go there and you can kind of get the overview of that. And so why did we do this? You know, why did we implement these subscription groups? If you if you remember, I don't know if you've you've had any uh, if you're a, a subscription ad administrator, everything was kind of done through Globus, through our, our support staff and actually through me uh, configuring our, our subscriptions. So we wanted to really give you, the subscriber, kind of more um, more control over your subscription so you can add in subscription managers, subscription administrators. You can add in people to your subscription. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. And so we, we really used kind of the Globus, the Globus Groups model. And I don't know if you've ever used Globus Groups before for um, access to collections or um, to configure roles on collections, but it's a really handy mechanism for inviting people in to, uh, to share, to actually access collections. And so that, that familiar interface was kind of in place. So we, we uh, modeled the Globus Groups after, um, or I'm sorry, our subscription management tool after Globus Groups. Uses a lot of the same code. It's not e e exactly Globus Groups, but you'll, you'll kind of recognize the interface. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, what a subscribed resource is, because that's going to come into play here in our talk. So Globus, as you know, has a, a freemium model. Right? You don't have to be a Globus subscriber. You can download Globus Connect. You can instantiate your endpoints. You can do transfers between those two endpoints. But if you want to take advantage of the premium features of Globus, a subscription is required. So how does you know how does that happen? How do the endpoints know they're part of a subscription? So we used to call these managed endpoints. So you would go out and you would you would you would manage those endpoints, and once an endpoint was managed, it would know it's part of a subscription, and it so it could take advantage of other premium features. Uh, namely, from an endpoint standpoint, it was um, uh, guest collections. You could create guest collections, and so it wasn't just simple transfer. Now it was it was sharing as well. But we're really starting to expand. You know, Globus is more than just transfer. It's more than just the endpoint. We've got lots of other services out there. So um, we've got flows now, uh, Globus flows. And we want our subscribers to have a little bit, you know, a bit, bit, of bit, little bit level of service when it comes to things like flow and compute. So um, you'll hear the, 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 um, the word now, a subscribed resource, right? If you're a, a, a user under subscription, you can subscribe your resources and make them part of a subscription so they can do um, kind of a higher level things than the, um, the, the average Globus freemium model user. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the roles under a subscription. You know, who, who, who might you be as, uh, uh, as part of a subscription? And kind of the, the first level is a subscription member. And if you're a member of a subscription, what can you do? So you can associate your own endpoints, your own resources with a subscription. So you're able to subscribe your own resources. And kind of the analogy here to the, the way things were done before, if you remember Globus Plus, if you're a member of a Globus Plus group, you could do things like um, enable guest collections on your Globus Connect personal endpoints um, and perform transfers between your Globus Connect personal endpoints. So now the concept is if you're a member of a subscription group, you can do these things. I mentioned flows. So now if you are a member of a subscription group, you can now author more than just one flow. Um, those that uh, are not part of a subscription, just the normal freemium users can only um, uh, it's actually, you can author as many flows as you want, but you can only publish one flow um, to the Globus, uh, the Globus interface. So the next level up is the subscription manager. And this, um, you, this is kind of a familiar term because a subscription manager 
this is what they could do in the past, right? They could associate any unsubscribed Globus resource, not just their resources, any unsubscribed Globus resource with the subscription. And that um, regardless of any administrative rights or ownership of that. And so the model here was people would say, well, I've got a Globus Connect server endpoint. I need to talk to my subscription manager and have this manage. Now, if you're the owner of that endpoint, you can do it yourself, but there's always the opportunity for the subscription manager to be able to do that. As a subscription manager, you can add, invite, you can approve and, and remove group members and managers. So you can add in members to the subscription group and other managers um, as well. There's certain parameters of that subscription group that you're going to be able to configure as well. And I'll kind of drop in um, to a demo of subscription groups and, and, and show you that and show you some of the things you can do as a manager. And then, of course, access and usage reports. This is the same. It's always been subscription managers were those people that could access the usage reports for your subscription. So the highest level now of the, of the roles in the subscription groups is the subscription administrator. And the subscription uh, administrator can do everything a subscription manager can do. Plus, they can add, invite, approve, and remove members, managers, and administrators. So they can promote other people to the administrator level. And the administrator level can control any modifiable parameter um, on that respective group, um, including uh, the, the description field of that group. And I'll talk a little bit about that because we want all our subscription administer administrators to go in and um, configure that group. Okay, so, so what is the subscription group? We really want it to be that, that portal to your subscription. You know, we'd like we'd like it to be the way that users at your various institutions, you know, discover that subscription. Uh, they can search on their institution, see if there's a subscription available. Then they might ask to be a member of that subscription. This is also why I why, the reason why I want you to update that description field for your subscription group. If those um, if if people in your institution kind of come there, we want them to be able to discover lots of things about your subscription. Eventually, um, when when we get a subscription request and there's already a subscription, Lev and I will kind of contact the administrators and send them an email. We'd like to just be able to point them at that group and say, hey, just go to this group. You can request to be a member. You can see all the information about your subscription, contact anybody at your institution, perhaps discover any web links there um, that might help you. And to that effect, you know, we'd really like you to, to, to update that description field. As I said before, maybe contacts for your subscriptions, um, be, you know, people that you want to, to be kind of that, that forward face of your subscription. Maybe mention any existing endpoints users may have access to. At the University of Chicago, we've got a research computing cluster. Most of us have um, allocations on their research computing cluster. And guess what? It's also a Globus collection. So you can go there and, and uh, discover various endpoints maybe that, that, that you might have already have access to. Perhaps cloud storage that you may have access to. If you've implemented any cloud storage, uh, you might want to tell them how to go about doing that. And of course, um, any web links. Uh, it, it, it's funny, there's a, a university uh, on the West Coast here that shall remain nameless, but uh, we get a ton of subscription requests from this university. And you know, if, if people had, Google their, their university name and Globus, they'd go right to this web page that their Globus administrator created that is wonderful. It describes everything about Globus. So um, we generally just point them there. So if you've got any web links, I certainly uh, encourage you to, to put those in the description field. Okay, so let's drop in and have a look. I see there's chat. I'm gonna just look in and see if there's any oh, questions here. Nope, okay, just general. And Lev, uh, Lev will be my. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Lev. Lev will be monitoring that. Yep, and, uh, I've been doing it. Excellent. And Lev, also um, call me out if I miss anything too. Okay, so let's drop into the Globus uh, web interface here. Should look all familiar to you. I've already logged in. And if you go to your settings page, you're going to notice that there's this new tab here, the subscriptions tab. So if you click on that subscriptions tab, you're going to find out any subscription groups that you're already a member, manager, administrator of. And we have several um, internal uh, Globus groups that, that I'm a subscription manager of, I'm actually the administrator of. 
And uh, if I click on that, I'm going to go into those groups a little bit more. Um, you notice I didn't heed my own advice here. Uh, I haven't yet uh, updated the description field for this, although it's a Globus internal uh, subscription, so that's not really a big deal. Uh, everybody that's going to come to this group knows, certainly knows what Globus is and how to access it. Um, you're going to see things here like your subscription UUID. Sometimes we'll ask you for a UUID. Um, as you know, in Globus, everything's done with UUIDs. Even subscriptions have their UUIDs. Uh, the subscription name, um, the subscriber name uh, with the ARNet subscriptions, the, you'll see the various universities, but the subscriber is ARNet. And we'll, we'll look at some of those subscriptions. You'll also see any connectors your subscription may have access to. And of course, our uh, internal subscriptions uh, for Globus, we've got access to all the various connectors here. So if you drill into the members, you can see those who are members, managers, and administrators of that group. You can see I am the administrator. A couple other folks are administrators of this Globus uh, internal uh, group. And this should look very familiar to you. This should look just like uh, Globus groups. So the same deal, you know, if you want to go and you want to invite other people to this group, you certainly can do that. If people have... Um, uh, asked, uh, asked to be members of this group. You can filter that out. You can see people waiting, um, have asked to be invited and are waiting to be members. Oh, I should go ahead and, and take care of some of that. Um, as well as uh, if you've ever deactivated some members. I recently uh, deactivated a couple of people. So you can, you can see that as well. Um, again, here's here you can go to the settings. You can go there. You can set the description uh, change. Uh, the group's name is immutable, so you won't be able to do that. Um, these are uh, high assurance groups, and I believe that is immutable as well. Um, we made them high assurance groups, so when you go in, you have to um, authenticate with a very specific identity to uh, to uh, access that group. So. If you don't have any membership, if we would drop out here, and let's say there were, you know, I didn't have any subscription groups and I wanted to perhaps discover a subscription group, I could find a subscription. And let's say I was at um, the University of Queensland. I could do a search on that and click on that. And sure enough, here I am at the University of Queensland uh, subscription group. I could ask to join the subscription so I could manage my own resources, so I could um, uh, perhaps create additional flows, publish additional flows. I could see the various connectors that I might have access to, um, so I could always query my subscription, um, my subscription administrators and say, hey, I'd like to use that S3 connector. How do I go about doing that? So again, that's um, pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, you can certainly go to your Globus web interface. You can look, look for other universities. You can look at subscriptions. You may be a member, um, uh, a, a member of as well. Okay, um, that's pretty much all I have for subscriptions, uh, subscription groups. We can uh, take questions in a second, but I want to end with um, a, a reminder that our annual conference, uh, Globus World, is coming up the 7th through 9th. I don't expect any of you to be there except for one guy who I know is going to be there. So I uh, look forward to meeting Greg in person at Globus World. Um, however, we are also having some pre-conference online tutorial sessions. I know they're probably not at the best times for you um, there uh, down under, but um, if you'd like more information about um, intro to Globus users, um, Lev is going to do the intro to system administrators. We're going to talk about data sharing and data fairness. We certainly invite you to register and attend these sessions, um, and, and we'd love to see you all there. Okay, that's all I have. I'm certainly happy to uh, entertain any questions here. So uh, let's go through, Lev, let's see, Lev, you answered a couple. So there's one question here for the various tiers of subscriptions, what does the cost look like? So what we do for our subscription costs is we actually do. So in the U.S., we've got, um, we use what we call the Carnegie scale. 
And that really, um, it, it's a it's a scale for for your your basically your research dollar spend, right? How many, uh, what you spend on research. So a large institution like Johns Hopkins is going to be at the very top of the scale. Small liberal arts colleges are going to be at, the, at lower in the scale. And what we've done, we, we put some uh, gradients in that scale and we charge based on the position in the Carnegie scale. So for non-U.S. institutions, we kind of back into that scale and, um, you know, we'll, so a, a large research institution is going to pay more for a global subscription than a small institution. And as far as that, how that goes in, uh, in, in, in uh, there in Australia, you can contact Greg for that subscription pricing. Oh, and you answered that. I'm sorry, Greg. I took some of your, your That's thunder. That's okay. There. And would also just jump in to add that um, with that subscription comes unlimited endpoints, unlimited users. So... Um, there's there's no additional cost based on um, the amount of data transfer, amount of users on the platform, that kind of thing. It's um, one price and uh, all you can eat. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, I've got unlimited use, unlimited number of users, um, and unlimited endpoints. And yes, we will be recording the pre-conference online sessions and we will post those to a YouTube channel. So you don't have to watch them live if you don't want Want to, we'll, um, uh, we'll post those later. Any questions about the subscription group service? Um, I, I don't know how many of our subscribers out there, I don't know how many people are just looking confused at that. Um, you know, certainly happy to answer the questions about that or any other questions about Globalis. I, I might have a might question have a about question. that. And the echo's done, that's good. Um, Gareth Williams with CSRO. We've already been using um, groups to set up endpoint admins, managers, monitors, and administrators um, for, for our subscription. Does that mean we've already... <laughs> In some sense, um, done the work. Perhaps we can we can simplify by using the um, the new subscriptions capability. So the subscriptions groups use that model. It's different mm -hmm. though. So these yeah. are not your your managers, your monitors of your resources. These are those that are associated with your subscription. So it's a it's a, it's a similar idea, but it does different things. Did that answer the answer? Well, maybe. I think we'll have to okay. plan and figure it out. I think we're, we've fundamentally got a fairly simple subscription arrangement for a you know, large organisation and haven't got any particular worries. We've also got a, as a, as a government organisation, there's um, uh, quite a lot of need for control and um, not a lot of will to um, uh, let many people be have any sort of administrative um, privileges with the subscription. We don't right. really want people to put up their own things. And, and, that, and that's fine. I, and there are a lot of, um, uh, the, I, I do know other institutions that do that, that say, you know, I don't even want people managing their own resources. I want to make sure I have the ability as the, the head of the subscription to be able to do that. You know, I, I, I don't want them sharing from their Globus Connect personal endpoints. And that's fine. Yeah, you have the capability, but whether you enable it or not, it's up to your policies. Beautiful. Uh, Jason, you had a... Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Jason from the University of Wollongong. Uh, just on subscriptions, if you haven't previously deployed Globus, and let's say hypothetically as a uni, you take up your Arnet Globus uh, service, and that includes subscriptions, would you recommend setting up uh, subscriptions as part of rolling out Globus, or would you recommend doing it as a additional or separate exercise? Is there an easier way to do this now that it's basically production included? Just your experience, I guess, on actually using it? Yeah, no, th that that's actually a good question. The one thing when people say, I want a Globus subscription, they may not actually need a Globus subscription. If they're just doing transfers and map between mapped collections, you don't even need a subscription. Now, and, and, and also, without a Globus Connect server endpoint, 
a subscription is really meaningless. So I tell people the first thing you do is set up your Globus Connect server endpoints, make sure it works for mapped collections. And now if you want to take advantage of those premium features, you want to do sharing, you want those guest collections, now go ahead and, and, and go for the subscription. Have you seen examples of both of those in terms of how it's actually oh. being r rolled out? And were any issues raised or were there traps to avoid or it's just just start doing it and you'll figure that out as you start doing it yeah as you start it, it, exactly as you figure it out as you start doing now so some of the traps are th th there's network configurations that have to have to happen with your with your globus connect server interface and and people would come and say well i want a subscription and they haven't done the groundwork and especially when we were doing trial subscriptions, three month trials, they'd start their trial subscription, spend the three months trying to figure out how to configure the network, and now their trial is gone. Whereas if they had started with uh, just a non-subscribed endpoint, or just using transfers, they could get that set. And once they're set with that, then they can go ask for the subscription. Do you have any numbers or analysis that you've done on the people using Globus subscriptions that you would be able to share just to get a sense, again, more from the university. Oh. I'm not looking, you've talked about, you know, you've rolled this out at a few places. So it would be interesting to understand how or what it's doing for those institutions or the community. Yeah. So so we, we recently rolled out the subscriptions group. Before then, everything was managed by Globus. This allows them to self-manage their subscriptions. But as far as subscriptions, I think, you know, I don't honestly I don't know how many are out there. I'd say well over, I'd say probably 250 unique subscriptions out there. I mean, I the we United, live and operate in, on those subscription fees, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So both in, in the United States, so the way, the way Globus is modeled is, the service is operated based on the subscription fees. And that way, you know, so so we were, um, a lot of the development was originally grant driven and that's all fine and well. But if I start this neat service and I say, hey, look at this thing that I built and come and use it and we'll be here as long as the grant's here. And as soon as the grant dries up, we go away. Now we've got a sustainable service, right? We've got um, users paying into it and and, and we're, we're independent from those grants. Thanks, uh, Greg and Liv. Both, I will say that, that um, we've got almost 60% of the R1, the top tier um, research institutions in the US are subscribers. Most of our national laboratories are subscribers. We've got a great deal of UK universities. Our penetration now into, thanks to Greg, into into uh, Australia is phenomenal. Um, New Zealand as well. Nessie is a, a subscriber and manages the uh, there. Um, so we're 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 all over the world. Uh, just jump in, Greg. This is this is a fantastic feature because one of the, one of the main um, or uh, a consistent bit of feedback we're getting at the moment is is for subscribers wanting to obviously, you know, transfer their data to um, an analysis environment or a collaborator. So the question simply is, well, who else, you know, down here has got Globus? So to be able to provide, you know, a, an interface by which it's easy to see what other um, subscriptions are out there or, or search for a specific institution or collaborator um, is, is really powerful. So that's, that, that's a fantastic feature. Yeah, and just being able to, even in the collection field, I'm always amazed at what I find when I go in the collection and type university and find out how many collections are actually out there. So Greg and Greg, I just point out in the internal conversation we're trying to have with this will always be around, um, we're trying to allow our researchers to do self-discovery and build their own workflows as much as possible. So from our point of view, um, having them able to discover things is extremely helpful because um, you do have an initial period where you want to educate people about the service. And some people are always going to need that, right? They need a little bit of handholding. But particularly the younger generation of researchers coming through are often going, again, yeah, if I don't see it on the first page of search results, 
then it must not exist. And we want to encourage them to be able to find these uh, resources and build them into their workflows so that it's part of plumbing and they just take it for granted because that's um, that's just more efficient, really. Effectively, our net is a reseller in Australia, right? We don't really have to worry about the universities in Australia. Greg handles all that. Um, and eventually, you know, the money eventually does flow back to us, but it, it flows through Greg. We've done some interesting things um, uh, lately or had things come up that might be useful to, to, to air. Um, uh, we've certainly got a, an upcoming outage of, of most of our storage in, in one of our locations, and we're um, trying to figure out how to deal with that as gracefully as, as possible. Yeah, sure, sure. So the one question I have for you, is it a long-term outage? Is it a short-term outage? Are you just doing some maintenance? Um, are you are you staging it? Uh, I think it's a bit of a combination. We've certainly got uh, a, a combined outage, as you do, um, and uh, most of it's going to be um, a few hours or, or under a day with any luck. Um, there's some particular exotic storage in there that might have a longer outage, um, and indeed we've got both sets of storage mounted on the same um, uh, endpoint. So one of the nice things about Globus, and I'm going to talk to this quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lev, because Lev has actually done this. Lev, um, although he's with Globus now, he used to be with Purdue University running their Globus installation. So he can he can speak to what, what went on there. But one of the nice things about Globus is uh, you can set up pause rules. So um, if you're, if you're going to do disk maintenance, you can pause all the Globus traffic there, do your disk maintenance, and let your pause rule go, and things will pick right back up. Your users may notice a slowdown, or they may say, hmm, why, you know, why isn't this transferring? But the, the, the connection won't die. Um, Globus will still will, will just back off and wait for that pause rule to come back, and things will pick right up where it left off. So Globus is excellent for um, those types of situations. So even without the pause, uh, the pause rule, right, you can just yank out your um, your network or your storage and Globus will try hitting and every transfer will continue attempting to, to go in and eventually when it comes back online, it will go. But the pause rules are nicer if you go into console and that's where you can uh, enable them and you have an option to notify or not not notify the, the owners of the transfer uh, that, oh, this is happening. And you can do global or local or, you know, if you, we, we, I've, I've used a lot of uh, pause rules. Uh, like I noticed a user was beating a, a tape archive tremendously. And so we would pause that particular transfer and then reach out to the user. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, that's the direction we're going. I think we've got a little bit of difficulty that we're, um, having a mixture of different storage and if it, when it's a partial outage, um, we'd quite like to pause for part of the storage, but not all of the storage. Um, so we, we, we may not be still at the best situation, but we're, we're certainly um, understanding right. that. Yeah, that, that, that's, I mean, you can do it on the collection level, right? Or endpoint, Greg, mm. I, I forgot. But that's okay. That's um, good, to, good to air it. Nice, nice to hear it. We're certainly um, valuing the robustness in any case um, when we're doing brief outages, we're just doing them. We're not bothering with anything because the transfers basically recover. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, the nice way for, for brief maintenance is you can do them depending on what's, what's on maintenance, right? You, if you need to work on a specific data transfer node, you can take it out of the endpoint for uh, keep the endpoint and, and, and all the collections served running with just de degraded capacity with only fewer nodes. Uh, and everything would just flow. And then you bring that fixed node back in, take another one out. So you can, a, a lot of things can be done even almost without user impact and without visibility to the users. Yeah, how are you, Greg? Sorry, I've come in about halfway through. Had another meeting prior, so I'll go back and watch the recording. Um, I'm a member of our cloud platforms team. I work with 
Gareth who's in the services layer. So one of the uh, things that we've been going backwards and forwards on is we really need the ability to be able to allow publicly available endpoints to those that aren't a member of Globus, and that's not really a problem for Globus. That's more of a, a, a problem we need to resolve with our security team inside of CSIRO. But one of the requirements of enabling that sort of a capability is that they want to see the detect they want to see malware scanning actually done i'm just wondering if there's anybody else on the call that's using globus or greg are you aware of other organizations that actually do malware scanning on data coming in through globus so basically what they're looking at doing is having it in a drop zone so it gets scanned and then pushed across the network um which well, I've got my I've got my own views on, but I was just worrying, wondering whether there's anybody else that's done any sort of malware scanning on data coming into the organization integrated in with Globus. I, I know here in the U.S., other folks do it, and that's kind of independent from us, right? We're the, yeah, we're the yeah. transfer guys, and once it's delivered, then it gets scanned. And I yep. do know um, some institutions in the U.S. that have that have done that deployment and management, um, ongoing management of of endpoints, and indeed any other. Um, Globus resources is something that it would be valuable to be easier uh, um, with. And the, the existing model is nice and clean and fairly complete, but it's also quite complex. Um, I was wondering if anything's changing in that space. We're not doing containerization either. That could be useful. Don't don't really know. Uh, we do, and actually... Take a look at this repo I just posted in the chat. Uh, there, there is an ans uh, there are Ansible re uh, recipes and um, uh, some Docker deployment uh, strategies as well, if you want to. But the good part is with the new model with GCS v5, pretty much everything is uh, is now li lives in our database. So once you instantiate at the endpoint, uh, right, that entity and all the configuration lives with us. And then you just bring in nodes in and out and, and, and bringing node in. We have a section in the, in the user guide. It, it, it's really simple. And you just deploy the packages, uh, and, and instantiate it and global and, you know, run Globus Connect server node setup. And and give it the the one thing you need that once you deploy when you deploy it you need the uh, at the init initialization initial deployment you get the J node uh, JSON key and once you have that file one single file uh, you can take a bare hard or any brand new hardware or or VM and instantiate it and that's it. So yeah, what, what I was doing back, uh, back at, uh, sorry, yeah, what I was doing back at Purdue, yeah, once I generated the JSON, I would put in the cluster uh, config management database, and that's it. From there, Puppet was delivering it uh, to to where it was supposed to be delivered and running uh, running a couple sing, simple commands, a sing, single script, and done. Yeah, that might also be interesting to us. We're, we're in fact also using Ansible um, up to a point, but then yeah, the initial deployment's nice and straightforward, um, but then the ongoing management, um, we've tied ourselves in knots a little bit with Ansible to, to do things that are probably just better done with command line tools or talking to the, to, um, talking to the service um, more directly. Perfect. Puppet could be interesting to us if there were, um, but that didn't come up <laughs> immediately until you said what you used to do it to do. <laughs> Jason, I see your hand. Yeah. yeah, I've got a follow up question to what Gareth was just asking. So I've just been tasked with um, we're looking at investing in three hardware data transfer servers and I guess what I've discovered is uh, th these things aren't cheap nowadays. Uh, so you're trying to get your maximum bang for buck out of them. And one of them we're targeting as our external data movement uh, resource for the CryoEM 
facility. So a series of different questions. Thanks, Brendan. You've you've also opened up even more questions about security now just by asking your question. Um, so the first one was, is there a recommendation or preference nowadays to use things like uh, Globus in a Docker instance or bare metal? Is there a current thinking from either the community or Globus itself? Because that would help guide us a bit in terms of the resources. The second one, I guess, was uh, just thinking about does Globus have any stats or does Greg via Arnett have any stats on the types of communities that are starting to build and use Globus? I'm trying to go to my Cryo EM director to talk to the other Cryo EM facilities and perhaps as a community come together to suggest that they all agree that Globus will in fact be the Cryo EM Australia default standard for making things happen, which it might be an informal one, but it would be nice to formalize that. Uh, and similarly, is there any security white papers or papers that you're thinking of putting out, uh, as Brendan noted, that would help to provide something into the CISOs or the people investing in cybersecurity? Because at the moment, there's quite a lot of uh, interest and or uh, resources as various institutions deal with various security uh, and cybersecurity incidents. So I'll start with some of those questions and I'll kind of go in the reverse order. So speaking about security, um, we, we've done many security reviews for, for different, um, different organizations. We have, there's a standard in the U.S. for um, higher education called the HECVAT, and we do have that security review. We've got a set of security documentation that we could distribute um, upon request. There is a section on our doc site that details with security that details security. Um, we do not have, what we don't have is the, um, like a SOC 2 report in the US. I know that's important. We, we don't have that. That's one of the things that we may have, uh, eventually get to. Um, but we do have a lot of different security reports that we can certainly distribute upon request. Sarah runs on VMs, but I'm just trying to get a quick answer. Am I better off talking to our ops um, guy who's implementing this to go, hey, let's start this out on Docker, or am I, for performance reasons, better off doing Globus and bare metal from a performance as well as maintainability perspective? I once had a textbook that, that was uh, called Chemistry the Experimental Science. I think this applies. Um, then, you know, when you add containers, that's an extra layer. If you are comfortable dealing with this extra layer of complexity, if you already have the infrastructure to do it, by all means, do it and deploy. If not, uh, a physical box or a VM uh, would be a, an easier starting point, and, and then you can translate and change it later. Um, either way is fine. You can have a mixture of, you know, a, an endpoint can reside on multiple data transfer nodes, and it can be a mixture of physical and virtual. You can start with a TVM, uh, make things work, and then bring in another node, maybe another VM, then bring in a physical node uh, and retire the VMs, or, you know, pause one of the VMs, get, throw more CPU cores on it. Um, you do need CPU uh, a little bit because uh, checksums take take CPU power. You need memory bandwidth for the same reason, uh, and obviously need bandwidth to your storage. If your VM has that, great. If it doesn't, it's still great. You just won't get the the, the, the tremendous performance that you could have got. But other than that, it'll still work. Uh, can I? I'll throw something in, Jason. I, I yeah. suspect, in principle, having a science DMZ and um, locating your endpoints in that is is the most important thing for something that's um, like Cryo EM, where, where you're really caring about performance, as opposed to somebody else in the university bring along an endpoint for functionality for integration yep. in the system. Yep. Um, so that may dictate what sort of resource you have to have, because if you have a VM infrastructure, but you can't connect it into the right bit of network then. Thanks so much to Greg and Lev. 
Uh, we probably let, need to let you go to get on with your evenings. Um, there was one last question in the chat I'll address before we wind up, and that was around the training that I mentioned earlier. Uh, basically, we're looking at, again, it's it sort of some of the, I suppose there's a couple of elements to it. One, just the awareness training, and that can be um, within the institutions, so aimed at researchers, but also in some cases the the um, e-research staff themselves. Uh, and what we're looking to do is is sort of, yeah, awareness raising, but also looking at developing maybe some more hands-on sessions, if there's an interest in that. Uh, there's another data transfer tool that Arnett also supports called file sender, uh, we see that's applicable for use cases for transferring smaller files. Um, so what we're trying to do is package that up uh, sort of more broadly under the umbrella of data movement and address that there's different tools based on, you know, those different researcher use cases. Uh, so if anyone's interested in that, please reach out to us because um, that's something we'll be looking um, to progress uh, later in the year. So I might wind up again. Thanks. Greg and Lev for joining us and, and thanks to everybody else as well. I hope you've found it to be a useful discussion. I know I have.